Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to lesson number six in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, just as a real recap quickly, uh, we're going to try to complete chapter two today. Uh, we have a lot to get through, but it's not really not too deep theologically. So maybe I think we can get through it, but uh, if we don't, that's fine. You know how we operate. We go as far as we can. We answer as many questions. We take as much input. And if we only get two verses, so be it. That's God's will, not ours. That's the Holy Spirit's will, not ours. So uh, one and the same. But with that, as we move into chapter two, uh, just look at where we were in chapter one. And that is the fact that you know we covered the genealogy, why that's so important. We covered really the birth of Jesus. Uh, we also discussed Matthew, who was Matthew? He was a tax collector. What about that and what does that mean? We discussed why was the gospel of Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, when in fact it wasn't by many of the historians, the first book written in the New Testament. And so we talked about that and we talked about uh, why did the wise men show up in, in Jerusalem and not show up in Bethlehem? And why did they meet with Herod? And which Herod did they meet with? Which is very important. You got to remember the Herods, there's several Herods that were kings or governors of this region that Rome appointed uh, during this time period. And most of them were very bad. Uh, and Herod the Great, which is the one we're talking about here, is probably the worst of the worst. So we'll talk a little bit about him and his demise, uh, really from actually a historian of Josephus. So we have a, a full a full calendar of what we need to get through today. Uh, for those that have missed these sessions and want to get into detail, they are recorded. They're on our website. We have an audio link. They're also on our YouTube channel. So you can go back and look at these. You can start them and stop them. Get 10 minutes a day if you want. It remembers where you are. And uh, you can pick it up and, and complete them that way as well. So we encourage you to go back and pick it up because we don't do an extensive review since these are being recorded. With all that said, I want to go ahead and move on to the next section of scripture in chapter two, which would be verse 10. And I'll turn it over to Annette. Okay, hey, Matthew 2, verses 10 through 12. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Okay, the first question here, it has to do with a follow-up from last week. We were in a discussion of the star when we ended and we kind of ran out of time a little bit at the very end. And so we wanted to be sure to follow up because we said we would. We went back and we looked at the Greek. We actually went back and had some discussions with uh, a PhD in theologist, uh, who's also a minister, who's also a uh, uh, son, uh, and got his input as well. And so, but what we came back with, again, this is not trying to force a decision on anyone. This has given you as much data as possible so you can do your own review, come, come to your own conclusion. And when we get done with it, really it doesn't make any difference in the long run because whether it was a star or whether it was not makes no difference in your salvation. And so we want to be sure as we get into scripture like this and we go off on kind of a, you know, a rabbit trail here that we don't focus on the real core uh, theology. We're not, we're really, this is called secondary theology. It's opinions. And it's important that you have that so that as Dennis mentioned several times, you have people that want to really have reasons not to follow Christ, reasons that the Bible's not accurate. And we need to be prepared to answer these things. And so that's why we present so many different commentators' views so that you have the ammunition, you have what it takes to defend your belief in Jesus Christ and to defend the gospel message. So with that, in this discussion, as we went through and we did it, remember we finished and said, from the commentator's viewpoint, was it, it could have been a star, could have been Jupiter, could have been Jupiter and Saturn aligning, could have been a comet, could have been a meteor, or it could have been some ended up and said, the uh, Shekinah light of God, the glory of God. So those were kind of the, the summary of, of things that brought up 
Uh, and as we look through this, and that did the research on this, and when you look at the how star is used in, in the Bible, uh, it's actually a word that doesn't really mean astrological uh, the, uh, Body. bodies. It's a, 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 a light in the sky can be referred to as a star. And so we have to be careful that when we say star, they didn't have a word for some of these things they were talking about, so they called them a star. So by far, by far the majority of the uses of star seems to be meta, met, uh, a, metaphor. a metaphor, seems to be not really a literal star. And let, let me give you some examples, is that we have the glory of the stars indeed uh, that was in uh, 1 Corinthians. Then we have in First Jude the wandering star whom to whom, and I'm I'm summarizing this, and then Revelation 116, the seven stars uh in Jesus' hands, those were the seven churches. So we know those are not stars. And then also uh we have seven the seven stars in Revelation, he that holdeth the stars. We have the morning star that's there, we have the seven stars of the crown that's there. So we have uh, the fallen stars. Remember we said a third of the uh, the stars fell out of heaven? Well, we, we pretty know that's the fallen angels. And then we have Satan referred to as a star. Uh, and so what I'm talking about there is that we have a lot of references of the stars referencing something other than uh, an astrological uh, body. We also have where it's really unknown. You can't figure it out. And then we have times in which it looks like it's really referencing uh, you know, a, a light that is a star. It, it is a body. It is, 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 is creation uh, in our universe. So it's really confusing when you look through it. But if you look at the majority, most of the time it's not used literally. It's used as a metaphor. And we have to take that into consideration. With that said, I think... Well, what we got from the input was, is that it really could have been a phenomenal issue like the Northern Lights. When we see the Northern Lights, it's a wonder and we, it gets us curious and we, we want to go back and see them. And so you have to, you look at that, it could have been something like that. We don't know. Uh, when we look at the wise men, whatever it was, we know it wasn't a normal star that you look up at night and see because they wouldn't have left everything and taken a six-month journey very costly uh walk and get all the way to jews not know exactly where they're going uh if there wasn't something that was really shocking shocking to them so with that that's really what we ran across and that i don't know well, you did some of the research you have anything else you want to add to that no okay so was it any questions well, I guess what I would say is just these first ones that are in Matthew, we can't tell. Yeah. So in in some places it was very evident that it was metaphorical. And then in others, it was very evident that it was actually literal. And the ones in Matthew, we can't tell. So right. you decide. Right. And that, that's where we leave it. So unless there's any further discussion, we just wanted to follow up that that what that was a to do that we had last week. And we wanted to follow up with what our uh, research there was. So any other discussion before we move on? Okay, so the next question is, how do we know the wise men did not visit the manger? Because last week we had some discussion about, um, you know, we saw many, we listened to many talks where they would say, well, the nativity scenes that we set up at Christmas always have Jesus and a shepherd and a couple of sheep and three wise men. And we discussed they're not probably being three um, and why, why history, or, Traditionally, we use three, one for each of the gifts. Um, but how do we know they didn't go to a manger? That's an easy one, guys. It's in verse 11. Boy, he was already a boy. He was already grown, you know, older. Okay. And where did they go in verse 11, right there on the screen? Can you see? Going into the house. They house. went to the house. So what we know... Again, and it's we do not know how much time, nobody really knows. Some people will say, when you go and look at the commentaries, there you can find somewhere from like three to four months up to like two years, which is going to play into Herod's timing. 
but so we we know it's a period of time kind of in 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 that range and i think it's very interesting he goes to the house and i want you to notice as you're reading the scripture every time that they talk about um jesus and mary that's always the child with mary um the child with mary so christ is always the focus we we know in in hebrew or in this culture whoever was listed first in a group was the most prominent so we know that that that's telling um, every time we see that, I want you to catch that, and you're going to catch it many times. So they saw ch the child with Mary and his mother, and they fell down and worshipped who? Them? No, they worshipped the, the child. Um, what we know, about, so what, this makes it very interesting. They're still in Bethlehem because that's where they were led, to Bethlehem. They're in a home, so they've moved out of the manger, and they've moved into a house, whether they're renting one whether it's a family member that they're able to stay with. We have no, no background on that. We have no knowledge on that. But interestingly, that, that poses a question, if you're curious, of, well, why didn't they just go back to Nazareth, where their home was? Um, is it because maybe at that time, until a baby was a certain age, you really wouldn't up, you know, uproot them and move them for health reasons? Or, or you know, could have that been it? Um, could it have been that Mary, of course her reputation was damaged with the people in her small town um, because they didn't know. I mean, they all knew about her. They they knew her situation. They would know when they got married. They would know the time frame. You know, they would be able to calculate that. So was it to protect her and her reputation? We do not know. Uh, but we do know that they did not go um, back back to the house. Uh, they, they were still in Bethlehem and they were in a home. And Collins, you have something to share. After the census was taken, most of the people that had traveled to Bethlehem for the census uh, went back to their uh, residences outside of Bethlehem. However, Joseph and Mary and Jesus uh, stayed. And so there at that after the crowd left, it a house became available, if you will, as mm -hmm. opposed to when they first arrived and the town was packed. That's yeah. a great observation. I didn't yeah. even think about that, but you're right. That's that's really a good observation. Yeah, and that, that was brought up by one of the commentators too. So exa exactly what happened is there was room and it was a young baby now. Where the other people came, they probably didn't have a baby being born while they're going in to do the census. So uh, good point. We appreciate that, Collins. Anything else before I go on to the significance of the gifts? So what do you, is there significance in the choice of gift or this was just the routine baby shower gift? There's three or hundreds. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, just what, what is the significance of the choice of gifts first? Well, I always heard there were like kingly gifts, uh, you know, gifts that would have gone to people with that, that had prestige or ruling type people. I can't think of the word. Royalty. Royalty, yes. Um, and that is exactly, that's that's a very s significant train of thought um, that, that in this culture, um, there is no one that would go and meet a dignitary or someone of renown or somebody um, that was important without bringing gifts. So the fact that they brought gifts is, is not unusual, um, but we can find significance in the gifts that they brought. And I'm going to go over the significance, but I'm going to posture that they had no idea how their choice of gifts were being used by God as prophecy. We'll see that uh, the gifts were pro prophetic. Um, we also, th th we say there's three gifts. These are three that are discussed or pointed out. But remember, most people feel it was a big entourage that came, um, of a group of magi that came to uh, worship or find the, the, the king of the world that was to be coming of the world. And there there would be more there would not just be three gifts of this hundreds of people there would be lots of gifts yeah and we mentioned in our last session or two is that remember the three wise men the three kings and the three gifts are all kind of myths 
and they were brought up really in the like the 1400 to 1200s uh so we kind of got that they were they were tagged and now we use those kind of as part of the christmas and we see see that happening and and really that's that's not scripturally accurate and that's i think what she's trying to point out i'd like to go and change your word myth to legend Legends? because okay a, that's a good. legend is maybe an extrapolation or um it's it's based on a true event a myth is typically fictional okay that's a good so point. i prefer that you would say that it was legend legend as opposed to a myth because good, we know good point. Okay. but so the the gifts are prophetic and this is how and charlie kind of touched on that First, gold. Now, gold was representative of either deity or royalty. And if you were going to visit the king of Babylon or the king of anywhere, I don't know which dynasties are, I guess, are ruling right now, but if you're going to visit any king, you would bring some vessel or some item of gold. So we know that the, by bring, presenting Christ, the Christ child, with gold that they were acknowledging his royalty and it, it possibly that he was deity. I'm not sure they understood that he was deity. They definitely knew he was going to be a king of the world. So they definitely saw him as royalty. The next thing is myrrh. Um, myrrh, excuse me, frankincense. I'm sorry. Frankincense is the next item. Now, frankincense was a resin and it was used in the temple only by the priests. And so they would use it for the incense to send up the pleasing fragrance along with the sacrifices. And there was, they were, it was set out how God had set out exactly how they would use this. And so frankincense would represent priest, uh, a priest. And then we have the myrrh, which is a burial ointment and would represent death. So we look at these three gifts of royalty slash deity, because both fit priest and death, and we see that these can be seen as prophetic for the life of Christ. He's going to be God and royalty um, from the, the king, king of kings. He is going to be, from the priestly line, he's going to be our priest. He is the high priest now. And then we have his death and burial. And so, um, interestingly, too, people went into this when we looked at the commentaries. You think, oh, well, you got all these lavish gifts. Here you have these poor people. What do they do with all these gifts they got? Well, we're going to see, you know, what happens in the next verses, I think, that we read. Um, but they're going to have some unexpected expenses that arise. And it's possible that some of these gifts could have been used to subsidize these unexpected expenses. And I'll kind of leave it so I don't cover anything beforehand. But we see that, um, and I think I'd like to make an analogy today. Notice that the wise men gifted the gifts to the child, not to Mary, not to Joseph, not to the whole family. They brought the gifts for this child. And if they were used before he was an adult, hopefully Mary and Joseph used them wisely um, for his protection and his upbringing and things like that. I think it was provided to help help with that. But interestingly, we all have gifts, don't we? And we don't give our gift directly to God frequently. I mean, we're not able to just give whatever gift we have to God. Usually he's given us a gift and then us give him one, but he gives us a gift. But how do we use that gift? Do we use it wisely? Do we use it um, to honor him or do we not use it at all? And so it's a nice analogy to look at how these gifts that came from wise men were for Christ, but were used by other people, the benefit of Christ, which is exactly what we should be doing today. Yeah. And, and as many of uh, many of you here, uh, I like to throw a story in every once in a while. So I'm going to throw a little quick story in. I think it's, uh, it catches, it caught my heart a little bit. And then uh, because it's, we we just got through Christmas and, and Christmas is a celebration it really is. I mean, Christmas is celebrating Christ's birth. It's his first coming. It's the first advent. Uh, but we have taken Christmas for the most part and commercialized it, unfortunately. And we sometimes forget. So I want to just do that as a reminder. And this is a little story. It's a it, it's a story. I don't know whether it's true. I uh, got it out of commentary, obviously. and But I, I think it probably is. But it says a little boy was somewhat, somewhat perplexed by all the exchanging of presents at Christmas morning there at his house. 
And so, and finally, after being perplexed a long time in his silence, he says, Mommy, why are we going to, when are we going to give Jesus his presence? I thought it was his birthday. Interesting. We're giving everybody presents, but we're forgetting about what we're giving to Jesus. It's his birthday we're celebrating, right? It's, but we're celebrating the exchange of gifts because the wise men brought him gifts. But the fact is, I thought it was an interesting catch that it is Jesus's birthday. And you usually bring gifts for people at their birthday, but never that I think about bringing a gift to Jesus at Christmas. The other thing is we think Christmas is a time of celebration, and it is. I just mentioned that. But when we look at the story of the birth of Christ in a manger and his first months or years on earth being you know, pursued to be killed, on the, uh, from Nazareth to Bethlehem is not an easy trip. From Bethlehem to Alexander, Egypt, which is where they're going, we're going to get to that in a second, that, that's not an easy trip either. Then they go from Egypt back, and they're back to Nazareth, and, and they first go to Jerusalem. We'll hit that. This wasn't an easy childhood for the first two years. And so we, don't, we think about Jesus' birth, we think about the celebration, but look, even before he spoke a word, the persecution and suffering this child went through for the forgiveness of our sins. I mean, it's just amazing when you think of it that way. And so when I got this story and I looked at this, it really it really came to my heart. So uh, I said, let me just present it because I thought it was an interesting view. So this next question, though, comes up, and I thought this was interesting as well, is what is the reaction to the birth of the Messiah, Jesus, from Herod, from the Jewish leaders, and from the Gentile wise men, the Magi, and how does that compare to our response to Jesus today and for the last 2,000 years? I thought it was an interesting view by several commentators. The first response from Herod was hatred, anger, didn't want really anything to do with him. We know people that really get mad to even talk about Jesus. Uh, we know people that want to kill Christians, right? We know people that really ha show a hatred towards him. So we recognize with those people. I mean, the next group, though, was interesting. It's the priest and the scribes. It's the religious. What's their reaction? Their reaction is indifference. They didn't even get to go explore five miles down the road to see if this really was the Messiah. There was no worship. There was complete indifference. They didn't, they wanted to hold on to whatever religious thoughts they had. Uh, they wanted to keep their, their religious interpretation pure. And so there was actually no interest. It was disinterest. You know, so we just ignore Jesus. And the, the third response is from the wise men who was actually from a long way. They were from the uh, Corinthian Empire, which is the old Persian Empire. We don't know how far they came. We know they didn't come from one city. It was probably diff several different came together, how they came together. And we said it could have been as large as 1,500 traveling because that was a dangerous time to be traveling, particularly with gold and gifts and things like that. Their reaction was immediately recognized Jesus, sought after Jesus, pursued Jesus, and worshiped Jesus and fell at his feet. Again, this is before Jesus ever spoke a word. So you look at that reaction of back then and compare it to the reaction as we talk to people today, and we get the same reaction from people today. They either have a situation in which there's got a hatred or an anger about God or Jesus, and they want nothing to do with it, or they're indifferent, they're agnostic. Well, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. I'll just be on the fence post. And then we have people that want to concentrate, concentrate their life to Jesus, give it all to Jesus. 
we have the same reaction today that they had 2,000 years ago, which I find is interesting. Collins has his hand up, so I'll turn it over to Collins. Uh, the reactions of those three groups, if you will, Herod, the priest, and the Magi, are partially as a result of God's plan. God didn't plan to reveal to Herod or the priest what God revealed to the shepherds. No angel was sent to the priest or to Herod. However, no astrological event was seen by Herod or by the priest, but was seen by the Magi. Uh, so we are blessed with having been revealed Jesus's birth, similar to the way the shepherds were blessed and similar to the way the, uh, the Magi were blessed. And we while we're like the priest looking back in the scriptures to see the forecasting of the birth of Jesus, we have that information so that we can respond uh, in an appropriate manner, not like Herod, not like the priest, but like, uh, like the shepherds, if you will we can go and see and praise God as a result of that. Yeah. Uh, that's a great, great point, uh, Collins. I, mean, I appreciate you bringing it up. I'd like to add one other thing to it as a food for thought, if you don't mind. And that is they did not see it. And I look at that as two ways. It's God's plan. Totally agree with what you just said. But it also... When a person's heart is hardened and their their mind is a is a set against God, uh, they don't see what we see. So you you're totally right in what you're saying. And so when you look at Herod and you look at the priest, the only thing I'm saying they that may have been the same sign, their hearts didn't let them take it in, whereas the hearts uh, mm -hmm. the shepherds and the, the, the hearts of the wise men, th their hearts were open and receptive to God and they took it in and followed it. So I look at it two ways, totally agree with what you say, but I think whether God re didn't reveal it to them or whether their hearts were so hardened, he revealed it, but they didn't see it. I think both points are valid because we reveal Christ today to the world. But a lot of people just don't see it. So it's not like it's hidden from them. It's we've got millions of YouTube videos on it. We've got churches. We've got, but people don't see it. So is it that they're not being shown the scripture or is that their hearts set against it? Even if they're shown, they will deny it. So an interesting point. I just wanted to add that to it. I agree with what you said, but it could be a combination of both of those things. Just food for thought. Seek, seek, and you shall find. Ask, and it will be given unto you. You, we have to seek it. And God knows. God spent a lot. Jesus spent a lot of time with the sinners, and He worked with them, and He, and he you know, and that's what we should, you know. But He didn't spend much time with the Pharisees. Why? He knew their hearts weren't going to change. Don't cast your pearls before swine. And God knows who to reveal what to. And he, he probably doesn't waste a whole lot of time on the people that aren't going to change. Yeah, good point, Dennis. Yeah. yeah. Jesus came to save the lost, not those that are not lost, right? <laughs> or the, you know, who think they're not lost. Think they're not lost. Anyway, next section of scripture. Okay, moving on to um, chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel, and they meaning the Magi, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. 
Then he rose and took the child and mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. So why do you think that Joseph might have been directed to Egypt of all places? Any ideas? Egypt was a powerful country. Maybe Herod couldn't chase him there. I don't know. That's a good good point. Well protected. Say that again. Well, I think that uh, Herod, I mean, he, he could go any way he wanted to kill this guy who was going to threaten his kingship. So for some reason, maybe Egypt was harder to get to or, or nobody suspected. I mean, obviously, the spirit knew where to go. Why, why he chose that, uh, I guess that's why we're fishing. Right? Yeah, so Egypt is is um, not part of Judea, so Herod doesn't have control there. He can't make decisions there, but but you're right. I mean, easily he could have just traveled there. Um, it wouldn't keep him from just going there, which I don't think he'd ever leave his palace. Um, but we found some interesting things about this. Um, the first thing is it's just really, well, first I want you to see that he got, that Joseph, you've got to be impressed by Joseph's obedience. Joseph got, this dream that he needed to take the child that they were in danger and how long did he take to make his packing list and get his prep work done and and close down his house and you know check his check with electricity water and bank i mean how much time did he spend doing that absolutely none immediately he he said he rose and in the night we're seeing he grabs like it's grab whatever you can they and they departed by night for egypt so we have to be very impressed with his obedience and never forget how obedient he was through this whole thing that um, we can't underplay the role of Joseph because if he wasn't such an obedient follower of Christ, then then things would not have gone as they had and he wouldn't have been chosen by God. But interestingly, Egypt, so Alexander the Great, we know he came in and he conquered this whole era or this whole area. And this is before now Rome's in power. But he did that and he named, he established this city. It's kind of a sanctuary city. It was supposed to be, it was a magnificent city, Alexandria. He named it after himself. So you have Alexandria and Egypt. And interestingly there, there you, when you, there is actually non-biblical um, um, documentation. So you've got Philo and he was writing about AD 40. And so he was, that's within... 40 to 50 years of this event of the fleeing to Egypt said that there was a population of at least 1 million Jews in Alexandria at this time. Um, so we do not know that, uh, that they actually went to Alexandria, but it seems like there was definitely a Jewish presence in, in Egypt. They were doing fine. They weren't persecuted by the Egyptians that we know at this time. They were living fine. It was as like expats. So we know that they lived in, that there was a um, a community uh, for Jews. So it would have been a great place to hide out. You know, it would have been, so if they go to a place with a million Jews, it's not like they go to this little village and they said, hey, do you have any new people? And they, well, yeah, that, that family, you know, they, they'd be kind of dispersed or hidden within this, this population of over a million people or this community. And so that, that was um, interesting, but it, it's just, it's interesting. Also, one of the commentators made the point that is, what does it say about humanity that when God introduced humanity to, um, to his deity and brought it to earth in the most simple, basic form a, a non-threatening form as an infant, still the reaction of humanity was to try and destroy him yeah. uh just just an interesting sight that i saw and it's it makes your heart heavy to know that humanity is has always tried to remove as herod being the first trying to remove the christ yeah yeah that's right mm -hmm. uh the the other thing that's interesting here is that the fact that egypt is uh a part of alexandria's empire when alexandria died Egypt was taken by Tol uh, Ptolemy, mm -hmm. and Ptolemy ruled Egypt. Uh, uh, Antipochus uh, Epitome ruled the, the Jerusalem area. You remember how evil he was, and Maccabee revolts, and in the 170 ADs, 
So Egypt became a sanctuary for a lot of the Jews that were persecuted because Jerusalem was being, you know, the temple was being defiled. He slaughtered a pig in the temple. He forced the priest to eat, you know, pig meat. I mean, it was atrocious. He's killing people. That's what was happening. So uh, Alexander became really a sanctuary for the Jews. It was a, it was a safe haven. It was a safe city to go to. So it makes a lot of sense. That's where they would go. So the other thing I want to know real quick before we get to the next section of scripture is we, we said that it said, behold. And Collins made a, a good point last night when it says, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. And we see behold, behold really means, hey, pay attention, verily, verily, truly, truly, you need to pay attention to this. And I want to make clear when I first read this, I thought it was behold, Joseph, listen to the angel. I read it that way. And that was wrong in my opinion. The behold is for you and I. Joseph was already behold. He had a dream. He saw an angel. He didn't need an angel to be behold. And so what is that telling us? And it really telling us is that look at the obedience of Joseph. And it's when it says, behold, the angel talked, and he did. And so I think it's pointing to Joseph's obedience, and the behold is pointing to the readers of, the, of this scripture and telling us we need to take note in the example of Joseph. The other thing about Joseph, we notice it's the child and Mary, it's the child and the mother, Joseph is not anywhere except leading the family. And all the visions and dreams, whether these are visions or dreams or actually uh, God speaking, we don't know. Because we remember the, just before this, it said that in the dreams, the wise men, would that all wise men have the same dream? No, I really think God spoke to him as a group and said, don't go back through Jerusalem, Herod's. You know, and, and so anyway, we don't know sometimes whether it's God speaking or whether it's the angel speaking for God or whether it is the angel of God, which is a uh, Christophany. It's a, a pre incarnate form of Jesus that comes to earth prior to his birth. So all those, when it says dream of dreams and spoke to God could be coming from those different ways. And I just want to make that point as we move forward. Next section of scripture. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all of that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had been ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentations, Rachel weeping for her child. She refused to be comforted because they were no more. So remember, we just got out of uh, verse uh, 15, says out of Egypt. That is also satisfying a, a prophet that it's going to go, he's going to have to come out of Egypt. So they went to Egypt for a particular reason that we're going to get to. Now we're getting to a section of scripture that is another Old Testament prophet being fulfilled. So I want you to, to look at that and we'll have that question uh, as, as the very last question here. Uh, so this next question, let me look for it, is what was the purpose of him killing all the male children? He wanted to kill the threat to his kingdom. Yeah, I totally agree, Charlie. There's a couple of things that came up. Is he was he was absolutely a, a crazy man. I mean, he killed his wife and three sons. Uh, he the killing a baby in Bethlehem meant nothing to him. So he wanted to be sure he got any baby that was in a timeline that these uh, wise men gave him. And so the whole point here was, here Jesus is born, hasn't spoken a word, and they're already trying to kill him. And that, that's really interesting that that's going on right now. 
So we had a mention, and I think Colin said that did they kill all the children? Because, you know, did they go through and check to make sure it was a male before or not they killed them? You didn't know. How did they know that it was exactly two years old? There's probably some, well, that looks like a young enough person and they just kill them. It was really a, a very bad situation. There is no historical documentation, extra biblical documentation, that actually shows that this was a historical event. That should not surprise us when we hear that. Remember, Bethlehem was a very, very small city. The number of male children very likely in this area was probably less than a, a dozen. Could have been smaller than that. And in the massacre which Herod did, killing a dozen children down in, in Bethlehem would have had no historical relevance at all. So it's not surprising it's, it's, it's not documented in historical records. It's probably an event that wouldn't have gotten any type of that type of documentation. Karen, I see you have your hand raised. Uh, yes, Rachel weeping for her children. Was Rachel alive at that time or isn't she like... That's the next question. The next we're question. going to get to yeah. that. Yeah, we're going to get Oh, that. okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Are we ready to go there? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next question, it says, why reference to Rama and Rachel? What is this all about and what does that mean? Um, and so to answer Karen's question, absolutely, she was not alive at this time. She probably died hundreds of, five, five, I don't even know. Years ago. She, she died many, many, many years before. Um, she Remember we said last week when we were talking about the significance of Bethlehem, one of the things was that Rachel was buried there. And, um, but then you say, well, what is this Rama? And so I went to search uh, about Rama. Well, interestingly, in the movie, The Chosen, or the series, The Chosen, they've brought in a character, Rama, who travels, she's a close companion with Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene is teaching her to read. She was one of the wine keepers at the wedding feast. And so they've written her, she's not in the Bible, she's something they've added. Um, and so, I did find in some places it did appear that Rama could be a, a name, a proper name, but usually it looked like it was applied to a man. But then you find out that Rama is also a place and it is very close to where Rachel was buried. So Rama is about five miles north of Jerusalem. And we know that Bethlehem's probably really close to it. It might be like part of Bethlehem or right outside of Bethlehem, not too far. Um, it interestingly, our sermon series on Sundays um, at our church here is in um, is in First Samuel, and Alkaniah and Hannah. Uh, Hannah's the woman who prayed urgently and feverishly, pleased that God would take away her barrenness and give her a son, and she would de dedicate this son to the Lord for the rest of his life. Um, they were from Rama. I, I found that and I didn't remember that that's where they were from. Uh, so it's just a small little place. So then now what is the reference to Rama and Rachel? Well, Rama, I think, is a location. I think it's this actual city. But Rachel was being used as a, um, a simile or a metaphor. She was used as metaphorically representing um, the mothers of Israel crying at the back back at the time of uh, Jeremiah's prop, uh, of first Samuel, the prop, uh, this came out of Jeremiah, right? Jeremiah's prophecy. The, this prophecy, I'm, excuse right. me. At the time of Jeremiah's prophecy, which is way before this, they were looking at, at, at the captivity by Babylon and the children being removed. And so they were saying Rachel was used as the, the metaphor for all Isra Israeli mothers at the loss, at slaughter and deportation of their children. And so it goes back to this um, Old Testament prophecy of Jeremiah. Any any other questions? Well, and let me let me add to that, Karen. To, to to add to this is that many many times prophecy in the Old Testament is referencing near term, and near term many times happens at the time of the prophet's life. It, it references midterm, which is outside of the prophet's life. It's in the future, but it's in our past. 
and it references also prophecy that could be uh, we haven't seen yet. So the fact is, is that I think this prophet prophecy by Jeremiah talks mainly about uh, the, the exportation of Babylon uh, by ne uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, there were three exportations. The last one was really bad. People were killed and slaughtered because they, they were not being obedient. But the fact is, is that we think that's the main reference. And Matthew's using this and tying that back into what happened in Bethlehem. All right, next section of scripture. We'll get as far as we can because we're yep. getting short on time. Yep. But Herod died, but when Herod died, behold, another behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to a dream in Joseph in Egypt, saying, rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father, Herod, now this is Herod of Archelaus, this is his son, was reigning over his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in the dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in the city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets must be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. So uh, we may be able to get through this. There's not a lot here, but the first question is very, very insignificant. How did he know? How did Joseph know that Herod had died? It said, but when Herod died, an angel spoke to the Lord. When you go back to the previous verses, it, the angel told Joseph, remember, this is the angel talking to Joseph. Nowhere is Mary in this picture. I find that interesting. But we always leave Joseph out of everything. So Joseph's the one that's getting the message. Joseph is being told to take and protect his family. So the, the angel did say that Herod was pursuing to kill you. What I find interesting here is look at what it says. Rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for, it doesn't say Herod. It doesn't say he, those is plural. So we read through this. It doesn't say, the angel doesn't say Herod died. He said, those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph didn't get this from the angel. He got, he got that the people that were pursuing the baby are now long, no longer in place. That included Herod and probably included some other people. We have an aha. Well, it it <laughs> just hit me. Why couldn't that mean that Herod was possessed by demons? Yeah. And the demons were, I mean, we don't know that. It just hit me. It makes sense that if you're talking about those, it's the legions within here that were trying to kill the Messiah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So anyway, I think that's, it's, a, it's an interesting point here. Now, I want to just run down here. I know we'll run out of time. But that's okay. Uh, how did Herod die? We have no biblical record. We just know here he died. We have to go back to Josephus, uh, which was a, a noted historian at the time. He actually gives a complete day of detail of Herod's life at his very end. And a couple of things I find interesting about Herod is, number one, he died. He was eaten by worms and his body decayed. That's the death he went through. Right before his death, he ordered a whole group of predominant Jewish leaders to be put in prison. And when he died, they were to be executed so that he'd have someone mourning at his, at his uh, death because he knew no one would mourn for him. That's the kind of evil that was in this man. Interesting enough, Herod Antipasus, that was the Herod around, again, Herod, but Herod around Jesus's crucifixion, died the same identical way when we look at the records. And those records were, I think, in Luke, not uh, historical. So what that, we'll go to the next question really fast. Okay, I'll just cover very quickly what is a Nazarene, and this is really quite interesting. Wait, I have one. Oh, I'm sorry. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> so what, where would the logical place that Joseph would relocate his family? Why, why Nazareth? And she's going to get into why Nazarene in just a second. So we may cover those together. 
But the fact is, is that you think he would have gone back to Bethlehem. But logically, they know they're getting the dream. They know they have the Messiah. They would go to the Jerusalem, right? That's where they would go. Uh, Archelaus was known like his father, very ruthless, very dangerous. So he got another dream that says you don't go there, even though that probably would have been the place they go. They go back to Nazareth, and we know they came from Nazareth during the census. So, and Mary was told in Nazareth by an angel that she had been uh, uh, been uh, seated by the Holy Spirit. So she had conceived from the Holy Spirit. She was told that in Nazareth. So it's really logical. They knew Jerusalem was, was dangerous with, with Archelaus and head. And so going back to Nazareth, fulfilled many things that were needed there as well. But we have to notice that out of Egypt, he called them. That satisfies a prophecy, another prophecy, that out of Egypt, my son will come. So with that, I'm going to go to this last question, and we may have to pick it up I next week. We're kind of out of time, and we can yeah. rush through this. So I think that the next next week, we'll just start with verse um, 23 and start with what is the Nazarene, because it's very interesting, and I don't want to kind of just skim it. Yeah, it, so. it's a lot here. We also have three prophecies that re that Matthew is already referenced, and now we're getting to the fourth, and the fourth is quite different than the other three that we talked about, so it is going to take a level of detail that we don't have time to get through today. So with that, I agree with Annette. Let's bring it to a conclusion and see if there's additional questions or input before we shut it down. I, I have one thing to add real quick. Um, so when Josie and I went to Nazareth, it was really small, or today it's really small, just a couple dozen homes, I think. But uh, from what I've researched, there's only about 300 or 400 families that live there. So they probably had a pretty good network um, yeah. in Nazareth of people that they knew. You're right. And the other, the other thing we'll get to that too is that Mary was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and obviously that had to be an embarrassment to Joseph and her. They were betrothed. It was out of wedlock. That was, remember I mentioned back in earlier times, that would be her being stoned for, for, uh, for that you know, adultery act. So it's not a place that probably they were wanting to go back to, because it brought back what the people were thinking about it. So it's not it's not a logical place to go. So, but you're very right. It's a very insignificant town, very poor town. What did uh, Nathaniel say? Yeah. What, 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 what good? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yeah. That's the apostle, right? Any additional comments? Dave, yeah, uh, I dropped the word back. Uh, Jesus had not been in Nazareth when he arrived in Nazareth, so he didn't go back to Nazareth. Uh, they went to Nazareth as opposed to going back to Bethlehem. Small word, but... Uh, some people may hear you say back to Nazareth and may believe that you're saying that Jesus had been in Nazareth prior to that time. Yeah, good good point, uh, Collins. I agree with you. When I said back, I was referring to Mary and Joseph, not Jesus. But you're right. It could be taken that, oh, well, he was in Nazareth when he was born, and that's not, not, not correct. So good point to bring up. We appreciate that. Okay, any closing comments before we close in prayer? Uh, there's one quick uh, uh, comment that I'd like to make, and I may have said it before. Uh, when the uh, baker that was creating the king cake to commemorate the visit of the Magi to the Christ child, he chose the oval shape rather than make it like a poor boy loaf to represent the, the path that the wise man had come in to Bethlehem and then went out another way uh, to go to their uh, 
their homelands. And king cakes are a big deal now as a way that we can, if you will remember, that they are symbols of the wise man coming to visit the Christ child and to bring him gifts. So let's, uh, whenever we see one or eat one, remember the origin of that. Yeah, that's a good point. I but, didn't know that. Uh, there's not a lot of king cakes in Puerto Rico, but it's very big, obviously, in Louisiana and Mardi Gras and that time period. But uh, it's interesting they don't come like a donut. It, it is got a break where they go back a different way. So That's interesting. Okay, let's close in prayer. Are there and there's a child in there, king cake. It is a child. It's a baby in there, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you bite the baby, you get to buy the next uh, king cake. <laughs> okay. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for a time to come together and honor you and worship you through the study of your word. It It is a, an adoration of you and the, the gift of the word that you've given us. It is a way that we um, acknowledge you and, and bow down to you by knowing your word. And it's the only way for us to live is by knowing you. So we just praise you and thank you for this time we had together and we pray for your blessings and guidance and protection throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen.